thank you very much to KPMG because this is a beautiful venue and next time I want to come before sunset so that we can actually see the view. But can I please welcome you here tonight? I'm Hayley Channer. I direct the Economic Security Program at the United States Studies Centre. And before we kick off, I do want to acknowledge the traditional Indigenous custodians of the land that we're meeting on tonight. And anyone who knows me knows that I like to give a bit more context and make it relevant to the event that we're in. So Indigenous Australians were the first oceanographers arriving on the continent around 50,000 years ago when sea levels were actually 80 metres lower than they are right now. So there would have been more coastline for the eastern suburbs to have houses on. <laughs> Um, Aboriginal people used watercraft and this is the earliest confirmed seafaring in the world. From Indigenous seafaring 50,000 years ago, emerging out of the water tonight is AUKUS. And that is why we are here tonight is to talk about AUKUS, allies and partners and the prospects of other countries outside of Australia, the US and UK joining onto this uh, historic agreement. So let me introduce our panel members tonight. Um, to my right, I have Dr. Zach Cooper. Zach is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, which is a think tank in Washington, DC. And he teaches at a little known university called Princeton. Uh, some of you might have heard of his podcast, Net Assessment. If you haven't listened to it, download it tonight because you will thank me tomorrow. Um, after Zach, we have Miss Jennifer Parker. Jennifer is an expert associate at the National Security College at the Australian National University and an adjunct fellow in Naval Studies at the University of New South Wales. After that, we have Professor Alessio Patalano. Alessio is a professor of war and strategy in East Asia at the Department of War Studies at King's College in London. He specialises in maritime strategy and doctrine. And our last but not least panel member is Professor Peter Dean. He is the director of our foreign policy and defence program. He was the lead civilian author on Australia's Defence Strategic Review in 2022 and all round good guy. Uh, this is our panel for tonight and I'm really looking forward to the discussion that follows. He is a good guy, Alessio. <laughs> I can only confirm one of those two things you said about him. <laughs> so obviously there's a lot to talk about with AUKUS and AUKUS is about two and a half years old. I remember when it was announced, it was the best kept secret in Canberra and all of Australia. I used to work in the Defence Department and I had no idea what it was. My former colleagues and I were wondering if it was that the Defence Department was going to announce that aliens had been confirmed. That's how good the secret was. But just to refresh us on what AUKUS actually is and what's happened over those two and a half years, AUKUS is very complex. In fact, it's the most complex uh, defence agreement that's ever been uh, established in Australia's history. It could cost up to 370 billion Australian dollars uh, and it requires sharing the most sensitive military technology uh, around nuclear propulsion. In addition to uh, AUKUS overall, AUKUS has uh, what we would call two pillars. It has the submarine pillar and uh, also defence industrial development in each of the three countries. But it also has a second pillar and that is the joint development and incorporation into military service of advanced defence capabilities like AI, autonomy, hypersonics, quantum, cyber, undersea warfare and electronic warfare. So AUKUS is a lot more than just submarines. Uh, it also has lots of different phases uh, which we can talk about. But what I wanted to do to start off this evening is actually to do a bit of a lightning round with the panel because this event is all about whether or not other countries could plug into AUKUS, I wanted to ask the panel, do you think it's a good idea to expand AUKUS's second pillar on advanced capabilities uh, beyond Australia, the US and UK? And if yes, which country is your top pick to join? So why don't we start down the line with Zach first? Well, first, uh, thank you, Haley. It's wonderful to be here. And thanks to the US Studies Center uh, for, for hosting us and to KPMG as well. Um, I'm going to say no at the moment, and it's not because it doesn't make sense for the UK, Australia, and US to work with other partners. It's because I'd like to see us walk before we run, and I don't think we've yet demonstrated that AUKUS Pillar 2 is functioning effectively. Not that it's not working. We're just too early, and look, 
on the American part, there are a lot of legal constraints that make it really hard for London and Canberra to work with us. And I think solving that should be the top priority right now. After that, great, let's bring in some of our other friends in the region. But for me, I'd say let's, let's sort of get AUKUS up and running first and then talk about adding to it after we've got uh, at least an example or two of a Pillar 2 project that's really functioning well. Mm. Okay. Jennifer. Thank you. And uh, thanks so much, US Data Center and UWA DSI as well, and KPMG. Uh, it's great to be here. Look, in terms of the expansion of AUKUS, um, you know, my, my response is no, and certainly not yet. I think AUKUS has a branding problem, to be honest. I don't understand why there would be a need to expand AUKUS Pillar 2. And you might go, well, we want to collaborate with all these different countries. Yes, we want to collaborate with all these different countries. We are collaborating with these different countries. We need to do that more. But I think, you know, AUKUS itself, in my view, and happy for somebody who was in the AUKUS team to correct me, was about Australia's acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines. And then there was a decision that actually we need to make it more than that. But that became a barrier, I think, to collaboration on some of those critical technologies that we do want to collaborate with South Korea, with Japan, with New Zealand, with Canada. And so I think a rapid push to bring more countries into AUKUS Pillar 2 would actually have an impact on AUKUS Pillar 1 because within the region, most people don't get the difference between AUKUS Pillar 1 and AUKUS Pillar 2. So really, I think we need to focus on getting some good wins from AUKUS Pillar 2. We probably need to rebrand it to be something else and then try and expand that technology collaboration. Mm. Sorry, that was my Okay, opinion. so there's two crosses. Yeah. <laughs> Alessio. Um, so I'm going to go the other way around. Um, there's going to be two yeses, I get a feeling. <laughs> The other way out, first of all, Pillar 2, since the announcement, the date of the announcement, was never designed to be exclusive, just the three of them. So when you say expanding, I would challenge the premise, because the point was always that Pillar 2 would be, by design, open architecture to others. I remember very distinctly the way at least Boris Johnson announced it on the day August was announced in uh, response to a question about France, um, and said, like, look, what we're looking at is something that certainly in Pillar 2 it's not designed to be exclusive, number one. Um, and I would say also something more, uh, uh, doubling down on the sort of uh, opposite way, uh, direction of travel, in the, the way the answers are going. Um, pillar 2 is already happening. It's just not called Pillar 2, because the UK is already working with Japan on matters of, of advanced technology, whether it is quantum AI or indeed hypersonic. Um, and in particular, if you look at it from the UK perspective, through GCAP, uh, some of the elements that have been mentioned in terms of disruptive technologies and how they're going to inform the development of next generation capabilities, these things are happening already. So, in a way, that's also fine because it, it goes to reconciling my position now, having taken the opposite road with uh, with their own position. Um, today, that these projects that are already happening in the region between Australia and Japan, between the United States and Japan, between the UK and Japan, and one feels comfortable that there is a sufficient amount of convergence, then you can turn around and put a nice bumper sticker on it and call it AUKUS Pillar 2 project. But I would say, yes, it was never to be uh, exclusive in that sense, Pillar 2, and yes, it's already happening, we're just not calling it that, that and we'll change the name when we feel ready about it. As in we will change the name so it won't be called AUKUS Pillar 2? It will just be more of a broader... Uh, no, I, th I, th I think it, it particularly projects. The way Pillar 2 at the moment is, is conceived is more like an ad hoc project rather than a broader endeavour to create some sort of a free trade area of defence. Okay. And so on that logic, particular individual projects, and I would say anything in particular that has to do with AI, and our AI is uh, streamlining the processing, um, if you want, um, of, uh, for example, logistics or aspects or support of frontline defense equipment, or indeed hypersonics. I would say these are the two sort of components of Pillar 2 to watch out. And to your question about countries, Japan in that sense seems to be the obvious uh, answer to the question. Okay. Pete, should other countries join uh, AUKUS? I, I'm going to start by quoting the great British um, comedy show, Little Britain. Yeah, but no, but yeah, but no, but <laughs> no, but. Um, so I'm sort of somewhere in between kind of Zach and Alessio, I think. And I, I come at this from two propositions. Uh, whether you like it or not, AUKUS has a brand. And brand AUKUS uh, is really important. And I think brand AUKUS is important when you take that away from the more commercial sense of it and look at a more strategic sense. It's about signalling. It's about signalling intent. 
the announcement of AUKUS was a, was a signal of intent. It was a manifestation from you know, the US point of view about integrated deterrence, about Australia's um, willingness to step up in our own defence investment and the importance of, of these technologies. So I think the discussions around bringing people in, because I agree with Alessio as well, that uh, it was Pillar 2 was never designed to be exclusive. So when you are trying to signal into the Indo-Pacific region about your strategic intent, when you're trying to signal about what you're doing and that we're doing it as an allies and partners basis, making sure the door is open to including other people is really important. So that's the yeah but. And the no but is, while there has to be an on-ramp for, and I would put Japan and Korea at the front of that queue to come on board, I would also hesitate for that for the very same reasons that Zach says, A, we've got to get some more runs on the board. Mm. This is a very complex bureaucratic system. We've got three complex defence and bureaucratic systems who are used to working with each other through Five Eyes that are still really struggling to get the nuances of ITAR regulations, Australian export controls, of getting security classification measures on the same level that we can all understand transfer one thing from one place to the other. Um, so I don't think we should be rushing to it, but I think, and, and this is why I didn't mind so much what Pre Prime Minister Kishida and, and, and President Biden did, was announcing that we're talking to Japan about this, because mm. it's giving a signal of intent that it's not an exclusive pact. It gives that signal to the region that other partners are going to be brought in, and this is around the regional balance and this is around events capabilities, but I also like that we want rushing into it, mm. because... The risk if, and I, this is where I 100% agree with Zach, the risk if we rush to add extra partners really quickly now is we actually don't get something happening under the existing three countries, which is already proving really, really difficult. Oh. Um, so it's kind of, it might sound like I'm sitting on the fence um, here a little bit, um, but I think we've got to make sure the signal to the international community is we're not being exclusive. This is not a little club we've formed that no one else can join that everybody else has to go and sit over there and watch how great and awesome we are. But at the same time, for the practical reasons of implementation, we just can't rush to this because we're struggling to get things off the ground ourselves. And when I think we see a couple of really good projects starting to deliver in that phrase, you know, capability into the hands of the warfighter that's come out of this really quickly, then we can look, well, okay, so how do we double down on that by maybe including Korea? Or how do we double down in that by including Japan into that? And I think there'll be bespoke things. It'll be on a particular underwater system or a particular drone or a particular component of AI or, you know, doing some, you know, uh, engine for a hypersonic rocket or something like that that we can do collaboratively. Hmm. So I'm the kind of, you know, you've got a, a couple of no's and a yes and, a, and I'm a kind of, you know, yes but no but. <laughs> so on balance, I guess, at the moment, the panel is actually airing towards no for right now. Pete, hold the microphone because I'm going to ask you the next question and then go back to Jen. But now that we know the, with the pulse of the panel in terms of whether we add new countries to AUKUS's technology or the second pillar on advanced capabilities technologies, are there any of the existing AUKUS countries that are more forward leaning in terms of wanting to bring on board Japan or Korea to broaden the agreement's appeal to the Indo-Pacific region so that AUKUS doesn't appear so much as though it's a Western um, Anglosphere agreement where France was kicked out and hasn't been brought back in. Um, is Australia or the UK or the US more forward leaning in bringing in new partners on Pillar 2 or are they all about the same? Well, on one level, you'd have to say the US is a little more forward leaning because the president stood with the Japanese prime minister and made an announcement. Um, I, I think if you listen to, for instance, the Australian Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister Richard Miles, he has been very, very forward-leaning on Japan. He's talked about Japan docking into AUKUS, I think pretty much since he became Defence Minister. Mm. Like this is a constant reoccurring theme that Minister Miles you know, uses that sort of phraseology. Um, but I, I'd have to say, travelling to each of the countries, um, and speaking to officials and different people, I think it's really mixed no matter where you go. Like I've heard officials in each of the countries say, this is a really great idea and others go, well, like, can we just get this stuff sorted out now? Mm. So I think it, it depends on who you talk to and what their views of it because it's kind of this big amorphous thing at the moment. 
Um, and there hasn't been really definitive decisions made one way or the other. So that allows this kind of, you know, a thousand different ideas of how to do this is a kind of blooming at the moment. Mm. Jen, can I go to you next about AUKUS Pillar 2? I want to ask, is AUKUS Pillar 2, as it's currently branded and presented, an attractive thing for countries to plug into? And also, we have heard, you know, Japan, Korea, maybe Canada, maybe New Zealand, uh, heaven forbid, uh, are led into this agreement. Um, what are the risks of opening up our advanced capabilities pillar to other countries other than the AUKUS partners? Yeah, look, and this goes back to the point where I think it has a branding issue. I think that people do a lot of mental gymnastics about what AUKUS is. Um, and I think that we need to be very careful that we don't lose the objective. Um, and, you know, for me, the objective of AUKUS is to provide Australian nuclear powered submarines. AUKUS 2 was about building it and seeing what else we can collaborate on. Um, it is attractive because of the messaging it has sent in the region. In some ways, the announcement of AUKUS, without having spent any money, well, it's research, but without having spent any money or done anything, you've already started to change the dynamic of the region, right? We saw the response from China straight away. We have seen things started to shift without actually delivery of capability. So from that perspective, it is attractive to countries to say, hey, we're in that club. You're telling your population we're actually doing something. We've joined AUKUS. And you're also sending a signal to countries like China who are being really aggressive in the region. So yes, it's attractive to join for those reasons alone. To be part of a grouping. To be part of a grouping, right? The sending a message. But I also think, obviously, uh, the idea of having access to technology, of being able to expand your defence industrial base, I mean, that's going to be attractive to a lot of countries. You can see why countries want to join. I do think we need to be careful that we don't put at risk our key objective in this, because we talk about AUKUS like it's one uh, homogenous thing, when there's this big thing, so $368 billion, which is not $368 billion. You know, I don't know what the figure is, but it's almost certainly not $368 billion when you clip out some rings. And then- Are you saying it's more than that? I'm saying that's a made up figure. That yes. 50% contingency. So yeah, yeah, $128 yeah. billion of that was, ooh, fudge factor, yeah. right? Most defense projects have five to 10% contingency. That has 50%. So that tells you how They have no idea. That number is. <laughs> So then getting to the point of New Zealand and Canada, I think we often dismiss New Zealand as not currently being strategically important to Australia. And I think that's quite a mistake. Um, when we think about our access to the Pacific, we think about our vulnerabilities in the Pacific, we think about our work in the Pacific, New Zealand is critical to that. Now, New Zealand has gone through a series of policy choices over many, many years where they have effectively uh, eroded their entire defence capability. Um, they don't have much. So I think when you think about the strategic importance to, of New Zealand to Australia when it comes to the Pacific, I actually think there is some benefit to Australia working how we do collaborate with New Zealand and bring New Zealand into the grouping. I wouldn't call it AUKUS Pillar 2 because obviously AUKUS stands for three countries. Um, but I think there is significant benefit in bringing New Zealand in. From Australia's perspective, bringing Canada in, I don't necessarily see, but I think the US would probably have some, some views on that. Hmm. Next, I want to go back to Alessio. Alessio, you mentioned Japan before. I wanted to ask you, why do you think Japan is so eager to join AUKUS? And what does Japan have to offer AUKUS? I didn't say Japan was eager to join AUKUS. Um, as a matter of fact, I think that um, uh, going back to a point that Pete raised about the announcement in Washington DC, you could see physically Prime Minister Kishida when the announcement was made being relatively uncomfortable oh. about it. Um, and, and, and that's for good reasons. Um, as a matter of fact, if Japan were particularly eager to join AUKUS, uh, I would be worried uh, because it means that the government of Japan does not have a real sense of all the problems that, that Pete and Zach and the others have mentioned before in terms of information security management and practices. Do you, do you think the Prime Minister would have, the Japanese Prime Minister would have preferred that it not be made public, some of the discussions that they were having? I think the statement, if I remember properly, says something like, uh, Japan and the United States have been talking about talking about <laughs> Japan maybe considering. I mean, the, the phraseology in itself suggests that, you know, had that not sentence been there, everybody would have been happy, sort of. Certainly at one side of the equation. Um, because the announcement was made in DC, one would presume that the Japanese side would have been happy without that being in there. And, but, but at the same time, I think precisely uh, because Japan is engaged, we have to take a step back. We have to place Japan in context. One of the greatest uh, sort of uh, uh, 
factors that emerged in the last 10 years, and this is something that the late Prime Minister Abe should be really given credit for, is, is a very different to Japan as, as, a security, as a security provider. Not so much in terms of military hardware floating around the region, uh, which it is, uh, because if you think of the Indo-Pacific uh, deployments as an initiative done in Southeast Asia, it's a very significant initiative was started under Abe in 2017, but more broadly, as, as an actor that is investing its political equity into giving resilience to regional uh, security architecture, whether it was the time of bringing CPP, uh, CPTPP together, um, um, or indeed, even before that, in terms of joining counterparty initiative, leaving off of Aden, when that was a, a serious challenge, or indeed all the other initiatives since Interfire's resilience of the South China Sea, or the East China Sea, or even more recently, insofar as the sort of uh, tensions across the Taiwan Strait are considered. Um, so in that sense, I think uh, Japan has changed a lot. And from a security perspective, what has changed within that context is the understanding in Japan of the importance of building the next generation of advanced defense capabilities. In light of the fact that Japan is coming at this game with a very advanced industrial and research and development sort of sector, um, a significant financial capacity to leverage it, but a very great lack of experience. If you think about the top five uh, defense industry exporters, Japan is nowhere to be seen because until 2013, it has very rigid expert control regulations, both in terms of importing military equipment and, of course, not being able to sell it outwardly. That has been changing. And what is remarkable in this context is certainly that relationship with the United States has been very important. But it does present limitations because it operates under the umbrella of the Mutual Security Treaty, which in turn created all sorts of particular political and legal frameworks that have not enabled the Japanese industry to learn the ropes of how to mm. be a defense industry power, mm. as, it, as it were. So the, what is happening at the moment, and certainly with the Global Combat Air Program, we've seen this. Why the Global Combat Air Program is very important in the context of, of your question? Because this is the first complex defense industrial cooperation endeavor that Japan is undertaking in a context in which the United States are not part of the conversation. That requires an enormous amount of responsibility and responsibility on how to learn, because uh, Japan is entering into a conversation with two of the top six defense exporters in the world, because both Italy and the UK have very considerable, well-established and renowned uh, defense industrial complexes and, and ecosystems. So in that sense, I think um, Japan's learning about the need to diversify its levers of power as a security provider in which developing a capacity for defense industrial cooperation is one of those levers. The steps that have been taking place so far suggest that there is an understanding of the complexities of becoming one such actor in the defense industrial space, which in turn, to me, suggests that it's been very cautious about being too forward leaning on walkers, mm. but very happy to signal that there is an interest there and further down the road because of the number of other projects that the Japanese are engaging with, it will get to a stage where it can be ready. Mm. So for me, when we're going back to the point that Pete was raising about the complexity of, of, of AUKUS, of Pillar 1 and sort of sorting things out among the three partners, of course Japan is not quite there, but at the same time Japan is having parallel conversations individually with each of them on other projects, which will help taking steps case by case to understand how far regulations has to change, how far information security practices need to be upgraded. That will be the strongest foundation of a sense of confidence of being ready to say, I'm happy to come and mm. join. I'd like to be part of this particular project when the time is ripe. Mm. It sounds like Japan's trying to create the muscle memory that it doesn't yet have to be part of this grouping, which it knows it would really like to be a part of. And speaking personally, um, I was working in our Defence Minister's office when uh, it was announced that France had won the 
submarine deal and not Japan. And we had a lot of Japanese officials come and that was a bad day in the office, let me tell you. Um, and ever since then, I've been hoping that we can incorporate Japan somehow as well as France so that we can be friends with everybody. Um, I wanna bring Zach into the conversation. So we've talked about Japan and maybe adding Japan. Zach, can you give us a view from Washington DC where you live? Um, you deal with a lot of AUKUS issues all the time and in terms of a US update, whether it's about how the US is building Virginia class submarines and, and keeping up pace with the requirement of the US to have its own submarines, how is the US progressing with its own ambitions? And do you have any concerns for what we saw in the Australian media, at least, which was uh, concerns that maybe the US wouldn't sell its Virginia class submarines to Australia because the US needed them even more than we did? So what are your thoughts? So it's a great question. Let me just say one quick thing about the the last conversation before I jump to your question, Howie. So uh, I think it's really critical that we all take a step back and realize, I think all of us agree that the idea of defense industrial cooperation between a small group of countries that are both capable and share strategic interests makes a huge amount of sense, right? I, I think all of us are strongly going to agree with that. The question is how best to do that and what the timing should be. And, and so I think one way to synthesize the discussion here is to say, well, I think all of us want to see AUKUS work. And part of that is making sure that politically we show that AUKUS is delivering. And you know, as much as I love AUKUS class submarines, they're not going to be around until the 2040s. And so part of pillar two is about saying, okay, look, we can actually deliver real capability in the next handful of years. And so I think that doesn't mean though that we don't believe that ultimately there should be deep and defense industrial cooperation between a group of friendly countries, because let's be honest, we're watching as China, Russia, North Korea, even Iran are working together on defense projects and sharing defense knowledge. And the way for us to deal with that is to do it efficiently, which means that we have to be able to deeply cooperate with one another. So I think we probably all agree about the idea that we should be cooperating. It's just a question of what the timing is and what we call it. Um, so I, I know it sounds like we're disagreeing, but I think the substance of what we're saying is actually similar, just in, in slightly different timeframes, perhaps. Um, and this, I think, brings us to the question of where the US is on pillar one. Uh, as you know well, uh, Pillar 1 is really three different parts. We were just in Perth. I think it's pretty clear that the phase one of Pillar 1 is going quite well, actually, right? We're seeing the development of facilities in Sterling that is really moving ahead, a lot of energy, very positive. So I think most Americans are going to feel quite good about that. And there's no one that opposes the idea of having American Virginia class or LA class submarines rotate through Perth. Everyone understands the logic of that. Um, on the third phase of pillar one, which is the AUKUS class, frankly, that's not so much an American decision to make. It's really a British and Australian decision. Uh, of course, there's some role for the United States probably with combat systems and other things. But we are very much the third player in AUKUS class submarines. And, and so I think the American role there is just to be supportive um, where, where we can be. Where I do have a little bit of concern, as you sort of noted, is on phase two of pillar one, <laughs> which is America supposedly providing three to five Virginia class submarines to Australia. And let's be clear here, this makes good sense. I see the logic of it. It's a political question in the United States. And it's not a question about whether the US-Australia alliance is strong, it, it is. It's a question of whether the American shipbuilding industry is producing submarines as quickly as it should. And on that, the, quest, the answer is it's not. We're supposed to be building two submarines, maybe 2.3 submarines a year. We are building 1.3. So the concern that I have is how quickly we can get up to where we need to be on the submarine industrial base. Uh, I think a lot of Americans feel very thankful that Australia is providing substantial financial assistance to the American submarine base to help do that. 
But until we start seeing the number go up and up and up, I think I'm going to feel nervous mm -hmm. that um, members of Congress in particular are going to be saying, look, this is a critical time frame for the US to have submarines. They're our best asymmetric capability vis-a-vis -vis China. And if we can't produce them quickly enough, is this really a capability that we should be providing in fairly large numbers when you look at the size of the fleet, even to one of our closest allies? That's three to five, right? Yeah, three to five, you know, and... Um, How much would that be of the total US fleet you're talking yeah, about? It's know, a significant you're, number. You're talking, depending on whether you're talking about the, the fleet that's in the water, you know, usually call it like 50, 60 submarines that are sort of in the fleet at, at one time. So is it is it a huge portion? No, but it could be 10%, right? Mm. Um, just about, which which is a significant portion of the fleet at a critical time. Yeah. So can we get there? Yes, but I, I think the strategic logic of AUKUS hasn't quite caught up to the political realities in Washington. Mm. Can I actually follow up, Zach, um, unless... Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Sorry. Um, love talking about submarines, specializes in anti-submarine warfare also. So, uh, love talking about them. But I guess I just want to kind of... And we went through this yesterday, right? So I feel like going around the board, we just want to kind of challenge that a little bit. I am not a okay with the thinking on the hill, right? So, um, you know, I, I completely understand that that is the discussion there. But I think really you think we need to flip this narrative on kind of the US is doing Australia a favor by providing these submarines um, because actually Australia is providing a lot to the US and the lack of provision of Virginia class submarines in the 30s would effectively mean that Australia does not have a submarine program not even talking about a nuclear powered submarine program it would be the end I suspect unless we can emergency buy of a conventional submarine which I don't think we have a lot of social license for to be honest <laughs> Uh, it would be the end emergency of submarine capability. And as much as, you know, um, I think, uh, Peter, you were talking earlier about the polling in Australia, about how supportive Australia is of the alliance, I really don't think Americans should take that as a given. So not only is Australia providing money to the uh, industrial base of the US to build submarines, we're providing access. We're also providing, we don't link it to AUKUS, but the rapid development of the force posture initiatives from bomber force rotations to increased Marines in Darwin, that is all part of a wider package and expectation. So I think that if uh, that was to occur, there would be implications within Australia. And, you know, as we've talked about, and I know that this might not be being considered on the Hill at the moment, but because of the way AUKUS was announced, and because it's not just about the capability, it's also about the signalling, should the US renege on that to a point where it actually was catastrophic to an Australian capability that we've all talked about how important that is, I think that would be fairly catastrophic to the U.S.'s view in the region. So I just, you know, the numbers conversation, absolutely. The U.S. is trying to get 63 uh, attack class submarines by 2050. That is the goal. Obviously, they're not on track. It's no longer actually three to five for Australia. So uh, the Australian Submarine Agency has come out and clearly said it is three, which I think is disappointing, uh, but it is three. And so it's, it's not really going to be 10%. It might be 10% of the operational force because we know you have issues with maintaining the submarines, but... I, know, I just think we need to have a wider conversation about it because in Australia we get so fixated on, oh my God, how many Virginia class submarines are being built this year? And I think there would be implications from an Australian perspective on how the alliance is viewed if that happened. Mm. I mean, do you want to get re right of reply, Zach? Well, Sorry. No, so I, I think Jen and I are in silent agreement on this. And uh, I think from the strategic standpoint, AUKUS makes a huge amount of sense. And um, the question is how to relate the political realities in Washington mm -hmm. to the strategic realities in the region. And unfortunately, as we've seen with many issues, you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for example, the strategic reality, reality and the political reality are often disconnected. And so I think here is where we're going to have to think pretty hard, especially, for example, if Donald Trump is elected, about how to pitch AUKUS, right? The, for me, the strategic logic makes sense. Um, I think for some Americans, especially those that are more of the Trump view of allies, right, which would be that um, if we have forces forward, they're not protecting the United States, they're protecting that ally, they actually would say, oh, you're moving forces to Perth? Well, that means that the Australians should be even more appreciative of the United States doing this. So they wouldn't necessarily see the posture upgrades as a benefit to the United States, they see that as a benefit to Australia. Mm. Not my view, absolutely. 
Um, and same thing with you know the submarines. There, the the provision of submarines. I think uh, you could make a very good argument, right, that there's no effective change if it's an Australian submarine or American one. Um, I think the the logic of this for all of us strategists makes huge sense. I think the question is how to align that with the political debate in Washington, and it will depend a lot on what happens in November. Mm. Before I get into that, um, Pete, I'm going to go to you. And, and as Pete makes his contribution, I also want to invite the audience to start thinking about what questions you'd like to ask, because I'm going to throw to the audience after Pete speaks. So, Pete, over uh, to you. All I just wanted to add was um, the way the legislation works, no matter who wins the election in the United States in November, that president will not make that decision. So the legislation is actually built in that the president after next is the one that will have to go to Congress and get the permission to sell those boats to Australia. So if Donald Trump wins, for instance, in November, he won't be the president. The current legislation will do that. So what I think we also have a role to do as Australia, we have a very good embassy in Washington, D.C. One of the things they're renowned for is not just in the U.S. system, engaging with the White House, but actually deeply engaging with Congress. We have a number of Congresses who are elected every two years. We're going to have to do a lot of work to support the US strategists and the British strategists to convince those political representatives in America that it is in their interest, in the United States' interest, to do this. And I think one of the other really interesting points is, as, um, as some of the work our team have done here at the Centre is, there is a record number of congressmen and women who are turning over this time. We're going to end up with a Congress in November, oh, sorry, in next, the next year, that has a lot of freshmen congressmen and women in it and potentially a lot of freshmen senators in it as well that are going to have to go through a whole education. So there will be an open debate, I think, as well, is the thing we've got to realise about this. This is not um, what Zach is sort of articulating and what... Um, you know, we're talking about in terms of the allies and partners stuff is a, is a conversation we're going to have to keep reiterating. And Jen's point is on the money and we've got to keep reiterating that, not just here in Australia, but in Washington, D.C. as well, um, and do that as a trilateral way um, mm. amongst all of us, not just relying on our friends in the United States to do it for us. Can you hand that mic yeah, to Alessio? Yeah, just very quickly, two fingers on this one, because I, I think it, uh, uh, Zach said something very important at the beginning. Um, so, as far as the UK equities in Hill of One are concerned, the SSN Orpheus is by far to the, the biggest element. But that does not mean that uh, uh, phase one and phase two are any less important to the UK. So, this conversation about um, the uh, sort of uh, Australian Navy acquiring the Virginia class is absolutely central to create the workforce that then will have to work on SSN Orpheus and develop the engineers that will be involved into the finalising of the project itself. So from a UK perspective, um, I think it would be unfair to assume that insofar as the conversation about the Virginia boats being uh, 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 sold to the um, uh, or leased to the to, to the Australian Navy, um, it's not something that would not see the UK equally engaged or committed, because any variation to any of the faces has implication for all the parties involved into Orpheus. So I, I want to make absolutely clear that. This is a trilateral agreement in which every single component has a spillover effect on the other. Mm. So whilst it might be less evident, and even from an operational perspective, um, planning for Australia not having those three boats or five boats um, has implication for the rotation of our students in this part of the world. Um, so this conversation will have to continue and uh, will have to be carried out as they have been done trilaterally because every single phase has implication mm. for all three parties. Mm. So, wow, that is a lot of issues to cover in a really short amount of time. I want to open it up to the audience because uh, I want you to have the opportunity to ask the panel members any question that you have about AUKUS. We started off talking about how allies and partners could plug into AUKUS, particularly Pillar 2, and then we actually went down the road of uh, the feasibility of AUKUS, the different phases of AUKUS, how complex it is even for the three countries involved. So look, can I invite you to raise a hand and ask any question that your heart desires? Uh, there's no dumb question. I would probably want to know the answer to your question. But can you please wait for a microphone because we have um, online viewers and they will need to hear your question. So with that, Ryusuke, over there, please. 
And can you just let us know who you are and where you're coming from? Thank you very much. I'm Ryosuke Hanada, PhD student at the Macquarie University. Thank you very much for inviting me to this event. Um, it's like a plain devil's advocate, but um, I'd like to ask a question of the possibility of the non AUKUS partners' contribution to Pillar 1, not Pillar 2. Because my question, I mean, from the industrial perspective, my, I always question whether the AUKUS country has a capacity to produce the necessary, necessary amount of the nuclear power submarines in the next 30 years or 20 years. Um, this is Japan getting back in on the deal, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not representing anyone, by the way. I'm, I'm just an independent Macquarie, researcher. You're representing Macquarie. Um, so I think in the report, in the media report, the US is considering outsourcing some of the shipbuilding to Japan and South Korea. So it indicates that there's a, some possibility that Japan and South Korea can cooperate to AUKUS by building some non submarines, I mean, or ships or just uh, conventional submarines for AUKUS partners, and given the some capacity availability for AUKUS members to create the nuclear AUKUS submarines. Yep. So have you ever, I mean, what's the, your view on the, those kind of the involving Japan or South Korea in the production or supply chain of the AUKUS Pillar 1 and the giving some availability for AUKUS partners? That's my question. Fantastic question. And I'm going to direct some traffic to make sure all our panel members get to have a say. So, Jen, you would you like to go first and maybe Zach, um, and then we could move on to the next question after that. Um, can we use Japanese and Korean industrial capacity? <laughs> so I think it's a really good question, actually. It's one that people don't talk about enough. Is that, is that on? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so actually, uh, there was a representative from South Korea, Shangri-La, that actually asked that question. I think it was of, of Lloyd Austin, right? Can, uh, can South Korea be engaged in Pillar 1? His answer was very clearly no. In terms of supporting the supply chain, though, I actually don't see an issue with that. I actually see that there is opportunity that depends on which element of the supply chain we're talking about, right? Um, it is a very broad supply chain. In terms of engaging another country to acquire nuclear-powered submarines as part of this, I think the answer to that is no for a whole bunch of reasons, right? If we're really struggling with talking about collaboration on Pillar 2 and what that means, cybersecurity and all those elements, then Pillar 1 is definitely off the cards. Would you want to pass that to Zach? I, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be really difficult to imagine other countries being part of Pillar 1 at the moment, um, unless they also wanted to acquire nuclear-powered submarines. I can't imagine Japan doing that. I mean, to be honest, if there was a country that seems more willing to do that in the near future, it would probably be the Republic of Korea. Um, but I just don't see that as a discussion that the three countries would be ready to have in the time frames necessary. I mean, we're already seeing the planning begin for production on AUKUS class. Obviously, Virginia class already has a production line. So I'm just not sure that I see it outside of some sort of bespoke uh, supply chain needs where maybe, maybe on an alliance basis, we look and we say, okay, here's one thing that we're having trouble building. We could use a little bit of help in that area, but I think it would be very specific items rather than a broad partnership. Pete and Alessio both want to put in two cents. <laughs> Look, uh, what I think you've touched on is a really critical point about the limited defense industrial capacity of Western countries facing modern geostrategic environments, and particularly on the shipbuilding. We can look at all three countries involved in AUKUS and say that at the moment they don't have a great record on shipbuilding, whether it's submarines or whether it's surface vessels. And of course, in Korea and in Japan, you have two countries who are very good at that. Um, so I, I think, and if you look, and, and, and to plug the USSC for a second, late last year we had a big report on AUKUS and workforce. We did a lot of case studies on that. We looked at the Virginia class in the United States. And in particular, what's happening there is they are outsourcing work internally in the United States. Up to 50% of Virginia submarines will not be built in the yard close to the submarine. They'll be built by companies all across the United States of America. And then those components being shipped in to grow quickly the supply chain and the number of workers involved. If you can get, name your country involved in improving the production capacity of US shipyards for surface vessels, and those people that are released from the US yards can work on AUKUS boats, that's where I think you get a value add to that. And it's probably even better to, to pair that even down more to look at forward maintenance and sustainment of smaller things, such as we see in Singapore, for some of to be done. Then you relieve the pressures on the shipyards back in the United States to get on with the build rather than the sustainment and maintenance piece. 
but we have to look really holistically at this. I think it's very, we're moving very slow at the moment. Um, the war in Ukraine is driven around production of some munitions and some other things. But I think as Zach said at the very it just it's a no-brainer. The big question is how do we do this in a peacetime environment across multiple countries to get the best equities? Because I think strategically there is an understanding that we don't have enough capacity individually. We can only get that capacity if we do it collectively. But what's the best economic, business and strategic model to make that effective? You know, there's probably someone smart at KPMG that can figure that out. <laughs> um, but I, I think that whoever can crack that nut, that is, I, and I would say to add that, that is politically acceptable to congressmen and women in the United States, to members of parliament in Australia, in the United Kingdom and in the countries that are involved, where everyone sees that this is a, a value that everyone's benefiting out of, that it's not, oh, you're taking jobs off my constituents. Mm. That's going to be the tough thing. Alessio? Uh, very quickly to add on this, um, I think we need to, to draw a considerable distinction between uh, a long-term conversation about uh, maintenance and support to forward deployed assets from the United States, both in Japan and South Korea. Um, that should have been sort of something happening for a long time. That's about surface combatants and not all surface combatants, not going to be destroyers. And that's a recognition, mostly from a political point of view in the United States, that the capacity to sustain and support is just not quite there. Um, and in Japan and South Korea, frankly, you have higher quality shipbuilding that can do the job just about the same, if not better. I would say even better in some cases. Uh, but that's a very specific thing. Then separate to that, there's Pillar 1 nuclear-powered uh, 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 submarines. Mm. That has a, ho a completely different sort of ball game because it's about engaging international nuclear regulatory institutions. It is about non-proliferation. The same way the conversation about AUKUS, the first thing that had to be done was for Australia to start engaging very actively with the international atomic energy about it. Um, and, and that will not be any different. Even if you're in the supply chains, um, there is a conversation to be had about regulations. And in Japan, from my perspective, perhaps in South Korea is different, but I think that would engender a requirement of political capital from the Japanese government to have that conversation that at the moment, I don't see the rationale, the strategic rationale for. Mm -hmm. So these two things are very, very important. The same political rationale that made absolutely obvious to move forward for opening up so, uh, 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 shipyards in Japan and South Korea for the US to be serviced there, it's not quite there insofar as the Pillar 1 related technology is considered. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, could we get a microphone please? And don't forget to let us know who you are. Judy Doyle from KPMG. So we've got an environment where in Australia we've, we've got an election coming up and we've got um, the, the coalition talking about nuclear power and bringing that into the, the mix. We have, um, I guess, the questions that that brings about the challenges that that poses to, to what AUKUS is seeking to do. We have elections that are going on, obviously, in Australia, in the UK and in the US. We have a shipbuilding environment, which is, um, I think, well known to be challenging just from a workforce perspective. We have... Uh, the challenge with sustainment from the maritime perspective and and we talk a lot about shipbuilding and, and needing to build that capacity but we know from the maritime perspective sustainment has also brought its challenges and we've got the strategic environment yeah. so so a very complex piece so my question is is what are the key risks that you consider that that are really pivotal to that and I, I, rec I recognize that there's a lot in the mix that I've just thrown to you but um, but interested to see how how we identify what the key risks are that we should go first to try and mitigate and um, and just generically your thoughts from there. Thank you. Hmm. Want to take one? Oh, so I can maybe start with an Australian one. And leave it to my colleagues. Um, I, I want to mention the civil nuclear debate. So I, I, 
I spoke to some journalists who's in the Australian commenting on this because I think it's really important. The civil nuclear question that Peter Dutton's put on the table is completely separate and different from AUKUS and it should be treated as such. I was very concerned that Peter Dutton and some others have said, oh, this will help AUKUS. We've got to keep these two mm -hmm. things as completely separate public policy issues because they are not related. Aur AUKUS is designed and specifically set up around Australia not having a civil nuclear energy. We've gone with Virginia class and SSN AUKUS particularly because they're sealed reactors that, we'll, that we basically will just receive. We will never do the reactor component in this, in this image. Rolls-Royce is doing our reactors on licence from the United States. Um, and that requires us not to have a civil nuclear industry. But it's a political debate leading into an election. And we've already seen three-eyed blinky bill fish floating around. Um, uh, I think we it's in an era of modern politics and discussion, we've got to be really careful because this could be really beneficial to the Australian public's knowledge about nuclear power, nuclear safety, nuclear regulation. And I think the economics of it, and I'm one of the people who thinks the economics of civil nuclear industry does not work. But if that debate gets out of hand, we could inadvertently impact Australia's confidence around the delivery of nuclear powered submarines. And that, that's a risk I worry about. I, I really hope, and the early parts of this debate up until recently have been pretty good actually. Like if you look at the Australian public's engagement and understanding, they've kind of been taking it on on the science, taking it on on the economics. And I actually think it's been a very civil debate. I hope it continues like that because if it is, we'll all be richer for understanding nuclear power, whether we have it or not which will actually make us more informed about what we're getting from the AUKUS side of things. But there is a risk going into an election that that starts to un unravel. And of course, the risk will come from the extremes. It will come from the extremes of, of the political spectrum. So I think AUKUS is so rock solid bipartisan from the major parties and the Teals, if you look, and we've looked at the Teals at the centre, they've all come out and been supportive of this as well. So it's pretty rock solid there, but I worry about from an, a short-term Australian risk, that how this debate goes over civil nuclear power, which should be a science and economics debate, um, if it can stay like that, good. If it runs off the rails as election campaigns can, I, wor I worry about it having inadvertent consequences and spilling over a bit. Pete, is the only connection between the two that AUKUS will produce nuclear waste, is that the only similarity? Pretty much. I mean, the scale of the, the nuclear reactors you need for the civil are so different. It's, it's a different um, type of reactor. It's a different scale. I mean, we're talking about seven of them. We're talking about decades long. I mean, about developing a whole level of nuclear industry that for AUKUS we don't need. I mean, the Australian Submarine Agency have already mapped out the number of people they need nuclear expertise. Most of it is quite small and quite low-end expertise to be able to do some maintenance and sustainment because they're sealed reactors. Mm. Building nuclear reactors in Australia, which we would have to do, is a completely different kettle of fish on scale and scope. Unless there's someone else really wants to jump in, I might just go to a final question. Yeah, Jen. This is a question though about risk and a broader question about shipbuilding. So I will just um, touch on that if that's okay. Because I think, so we know that there are significant risks and I think they've been pretty well articulated, to be honest, right? We know about the workforce challenges and all that sort of thing. The problem is that we have had such a stop-start approach that we keep coming to this point. Um, historically, Australia has built plenty of ships. In fact, there was a point where we built 60 ships and exported them to India and to the UK during World War II. But this stop-start approach has been really, really unhelpful. So I think we kind of need to acknowledge that. We need to make sure that there is ongoing work and have an ongoing plan. And we've found ourselves in this position right now because we knew we needed to replace our capabilities. We didn't do continuous shipbuilding despite the fact that we talked about it. And then we made it so long to make a decision that we're now effectively kind of rebuilding a whole lot of the workforce. So we need to annoy, avoid doing that in the future. I think it's really critical. Alessio. Uh, very quickly, two, two big things on, on the shipbuilding side of things. Um, from what I've seen, uh, part of the problem is project management. If you look at the uh, OPV uh, class or the Hunter class, when you start looking into the details of the amount of changes from the moment the contract was awarded to where they are now, that's a fundamental problem because that will slow down how we get the first one of the ramp into the water and then you pass on to the others. So generally speaking, I would say 
yes, there is a capacity in workforce, but let's not forget that the number of projects that are ongoing, one of the critical issues around that has been project management and the continuous demand of requests. For the hunter class, the hunter class is not a Type 26 anymore. It's longer, it's larger, it's a cruiser. It's not even a frigate, if you look at it by the standards of today. So in that sense, one has, that is also an aspect that needs to be looked at because you can increase the workforce, you can increase the capacity and still having very long times for shipbuilding to come about simply because the project management slows down the projects that are built. That's one thing. The other thing is also one of, uh, and this is something that we started to experience in the UK as well, um, of communicating how different the world of uh, shipbuilding is today and sort of uh, presented a, a stronger connection from teenagers upwards, what it means to be involved into that. Because unless people understand what it is that they're going to get themselves into, if they've got an options for other career paths, they'll go for other career paths. One example, modern welding is absolutely not what it used to be even 20 years ago. Most people, and I've noticed this when I was in Adelaide a month ago, um, a BA system is starting to put out um, programs of reach out to secondary schools to explain what an apprenticeship in modern welding looks like. Because a modern welder is basically someone that is looking at a computer and from time to time will do final chart touches um, on, on, on the actual sort of like uh, 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 putting sort of pieces of metal together. But otherwise it's a very different job. So communicating and explaining how different the world of shipbuilding is today and the different type of skills that the workforce needs to have Again, it's an important element to give depth, granularity and understanding for those that may or may not choose that career path at some mm. point. So we've come to the end of the event and food has started arriving and that is when I know it's my cue to start to wrap up. But I've also been timekeeping in terms of who's been able to speak um, for the most amount of time and I do want to give the last question to Zach and it's going to be a question of my own. So Zach, I want you to imagine... Uh, we're years and years into the future. The year is 2040, uh, 16 years away from now. And I'm going to let you choose your own adventure in terms of, can you tell us by the year 2040, either what is the absolute best case scenario for AUKUS by the year 2040, or you can choose to answer the question, what is the most realistic outcome in 2040 that we're all facing? So either a kind of glass full or um, a glass half full view. I'm going to do the glass full. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're clapping because I'm usually, I'm yeah, always, yeah. I'm always the pessimist. Yeah. Um, look, I, I, I think the optimistic version is that, um, you know, in the next decade, Australia becomes proficient operating nuclear powered submarines alongside the United Kingdom and the United States. We have um, a substantial fleet in Perth that is operating effectively across the Indian Ocean, across the Pacific. Um, and also, and I think this is a, a big question, um, look, 2040 is a long time away. Uh, I would expect that by 2040, we'll have not just different governments in our countries, but we'll have a different government in China, to be very candid. Um, the Chinese economy is going to go through some pretty serious bumps between now and 2040. And so I think the really optimistic vision is one in which we have actually a better strategic situation, one where both we have ramped up our military capabilities and feel more confident in our deterrence capabilities, you know, maybe in Europe, frankly, as well as Asia, but also where potentially some of the countries that we're struggling to deal with have seen changes in leadership, right? right. And I, I think a world in which Vladimir Putin is no longer the president of Russia and one where Xi Jinping is no longer the general secretary of China is a world where actually we may feel that the strategic situation is much more stable than we feel today. So I think that's the optimistic picture. And part of August is about having the ability to get us to 2040 and have stability between now and then. And then if I'm wrong and the strategic situation is worse, then hopefully we'll have AUKUS class submarines coming online in the 2040s that are gonna provide that stability. Nice. Zach, I had no idea I would finish this event feeling actually good <laughs> and positive about our future. But look, with that, can I please invite the audience to thank our fantastic panel, Zach, Jen, Alessio, and Pete, please join me.
Go Bombers.